sorry missed uh, yesterday's <clears throat> day one event at the Iranian Embassy Siege. Serious problems fixed late last night and into the early hours of the morning. Done. So what should have come out yesterday didn't. So I'm going to quickly go through day one of the Iranian Embassy Siege and what happened. There's my book. Six Days of the Movie, it came from that book. Mrs. Margaret Thatcher read the book, Christmas 2011, delivered to her and signed. So, if you want it, you could just go to my website, www.rusty-fermin.org forward slash shop. That's it. Everything's on there. And of course, it, whatever you want, I do. And it tells you on there exactly what I'll do. Sign it, dedicate, whatever. Anyway, because there are no, um, there's no way now of getting extra stock in and stuff. Once this is gone, it's gone until it comes back into stock. When is that going to be? How long is a piece of string? No idea. Okay, same with the prints on there. I've got some prints left. They're all going to go. And that'll be a separate video from tomorrow. And they'll all be signed 5th of May, which is the date of the resolution to the siege. Once they've gone, there'll be no more signed on that date. Okay, so I'll put a separate video out, the costumes and how to go about it, probably over the weekend. But... Once they've gone, they've gone. That's it. 40 years on. So, we move on to day one. You know, if you want to subscribe free to my YouTube channel, that'd be great. It's just Rusty Fermin SAS TV. And... There's a couple of thousand plus now subscribers on there who are enjoying what we're doing. And of course, there's more to come. And I hope there will be more to come. And I'm glad that I can share stuff because, you know, that's what I was asked to do and that's what I'll do. So the 30th of April... 1980, day one of the siege. What happened? Six armed terrorists walked over the road from Hyde Park, where they'd been sat waiting for a chance to take over the embassy, the Iranian embassy. Once that chance appeared, they took it. Unfortunately, PC Trevor Locke who was on duty that day, but standing in, as you sometimes do on shift, decided that he'd have a cup of the lovely coffee that the Iranians make. Why not? Would I have done the same in his position? Probably yes. You know, a shift there's a long shift. However, that's when they, the, um, terrorists decided let's have a go no policemen outside over they go six of them armed scorpion weapons handguns and grenades a whole lot took it over battered through the first door locked it chained it 26 hostages they have a bargaining tool best of luck didn't quite work out the way they thought it would in the end but sometimes that happens. And, you know, it's about 11.30 in the morning, thereabouts. Didn't know an awful lot about it. There was no media, no uh, Facebook, no anything. No, um, it was just a day that something had happened. But the SAS, us, were planning on going on a weekend um, trip, <laughs> the trip, 
a trip which you might call an exercise. We weren't supposed to know, but we actually did know we were going to Northumbria. You know, intelligence gathering and stuff. <laughs> but we didn't know when it was going to start, I have to say. And it wasn't actually until um, we got the call out by pages, the little blue things about this big. Uh, used to bleep, different sets of numbers meant different things. Well, that was started bleeping as nines. Oh, it's a mistake. Nine is operational call out. All the other numbers uh, denote something else, not interested. But actually, because we thought there was an exercise going on as well, this was the start of it. And this was a Wednesday, it was a little bit. It didn't normally start them on a Wednesday, it'd be normally more towards the weekend. But because they had the nines on, there was no pissing about, you know, we shot across the camp. Two teams, red and blue team, one team would have been on 30 minutes notice, one team on three hours. But in general, you get in there as quickly as you can. Um, I was one of the nosy ones who wanted to get in there first. Terminal 4. Heard some of his radio, called the colonel, said there's an incident, this, that, 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 that. Um, I don't know what the conversation was exactly, but I've spoken to him before I did the book. And he told him, and of course the colonel thought, that's only dusty, bit of a joker, but quite a shrewd cookie up here. So he was just trying to pass on the early warning, you know. That was our social media brains, adaptability information, confirmation. That was it. And that's what Dusty did. He didn't know that the Colonel might have thought he was taking the piss. Why would he? He had no reason to. He had a good job. And that's how it went on. So, the <laughs> if, once we got the call out about 11.48 that morning, everybody's there. Slight brief. What we're going to do? Well, actually, I call it hurry up and wait. For most of us, it was a wait all day long. But the um, lack of information just meant we just got to make sure everything's okay. The lads are actually repacking the kit and repacking it again because it's still an operation in London, but we don't know the full outcome of it. So that went on and there wasn't a problem with that. About 14.58 in the afternoon, the headshed took off for a meeting at the Defence um, Situation Centre in London. So we were still there, packed, ready to go, ten times over, but they'd gone for a briefing. They got there somewhere after five o'clock and... Um, by then we started to get bits of information that we were going to be likely to move somewhere very quickly. That was it. Five o'clock at night? Didn't really matter. Weren't going anywhere else anyway. We hadn't long taken over from D Squadron. I think it was a couple of weeks. They had the SP team before us, counter-terrorist team. We'd taken it over and now we're the guys who are going to do the job, whatever it happens to be. Part of the scene. I'd been on it before, um, you know, two years earlier. And when I think back, it changed, it was, it did change my life in certain ways eventually, but not in the day. It was a job that we all did. So the head shed, as we call it, would be the sergeant major, the officer in command of the squadron. It would be intelligence and communications. Off they went. They are the advance party to let us know what's going on eventually. So after their meeting with the Defence Situation Centre in London, 
They then disappeared. The head shed that is down to Regent's Park Barracks, the main base station. That's where we would all end up. And of course, um, about 1930 that night, we departed Hereford in small groups of vehicles to avoid drawing attention as best we can in those days. Nowadays, you wouldn't get five foot outside the, the camp gates. But there again, they don't do exactly what we did back then. So that was it. We headed off down to Beaconsfield off the um, M40. Once we got there, the um, at Beaconsfield, the Army School of Languages, we got a briefing, not much, fed and watered because it was where we were going to end up at Regent's Park Barracks. They couldn't cope with that amount of bodies, us as a squadron, to feed and water straight away. So we stopped off there, had another briefing, then moved on. Once in uh, Regent's Park, sorry, once in Beaconsfield, we sat there for a long time, eating, getting sorted out, before finally moving to Regent's Park Barracks, which would be the main base station. Main base station is where we would be centralised as a whole squadron, ready to deploy wherever, in whatever period of time they thought suitable, I suppose. Um, so there we were. It was fun and games while we were at Regent's Park Barracks in the book. Let's just say putting the chef's hands on the hot plate because he wasn't performing is one of them. It's all in there, and that's that. So, once in Regent's Park Barracks, it was quite obvious that we were three and a half to four miles away from the incident. Too far. London traffic, day or night, long time. Something happens if you required, too far. So the head shed, as we call them, decided that we'll send a team down, covertly, driven by police. They know the area inside out covertly and we'd drive one team down there get them in next door to the terrorists and that's what happened it's in the book it's in the film for six days that that would be the best approach unfortunately for me that was blue team it was the red team that went down first which meant that from the holding area down there, driven down, small vans into position. Once in uh, Regent's Park, sorry, once in Beaconsfield, we sat there for a long time, eating, getting sorted out, before finally moving to Regent's Park Barracks, which would be the main base station. Main base station is where we would be centralised as a whole squadron, ready to deploy wherever in whatever period of time they thought suitable, I suppose. Um, so there we were. It was fun and games while we were Regent's Park Barracks, in the book. Let's just say putting the chef's hands on the hot plate because he wasn't performing is one of them. It's all in there, and that's that. So once in Regent's Park Barracks, it was quite obvious that we were three and a half to four miles away from the incident. Too far. London traffic, day or night, long time. Something happens if you required, too far. So the head shed, as we call them, decided that we'll send a team down, covertly, driven by police. They know the area inside out, covertly. And we'd drive one team down there, get them in next door to the terrorists. And that's what happened. It's in the book, it's in the film for six days, that that would be the best approach. Unfortunately for me, that was blue team. It was the red team that went down first, which meant that from the holding area down there, driven down, small vans into position. 
and then drop them off on the wall on the left hand side of 1415 Princess Gate, the Royal College of General Practitioners. Perfect, a covered approach with a door leading into there, which would become our holding area for the squadron eventually. We, Blue Team, are sat back in Regent's Park. Yeah, pissed off? Hmm, no. Professional? Yeah. It's a plan, and generally it's a good plan. Eventually it came out as a great plan, because it worked. But you can't tell me that the excitement, adrenaline, and everything else inside your body is saying, I wish it was me, but it wasn't. If something had happened in the first couple of days, Red Team would have dealt with it. I don't have any issues with that. It would have been dealt with. But my saviour, Mr. Max Vernon, he kept them talking for six days, which we'll come on to. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. He feels that sometimes he may have failed. There's nobody told him more times than me. You ain't failed, mate. You've given us time to plan, prepare, rehearse. And eventually, do it properly. And that's what we did. So, you know, but that didn't take place. And I'm going to skip forward slightly. But it's really nice to be chauffeured from Regis Park Barracks to the Rain Embassy by Metropolitan Police. Because the only time I've ever been in a van before that, or a car, is generally when I've had my knuckles slapped for something. So I felt comfortable. Rusty is comfortable. And the Metropolitan Police, to me, get tremendous respect. Tremendous respect for what they did. And how they remember this as well that this was never an SAS operation it was Metropolitan Police SAS were there to support the Metropolitan Police okay a lot of people don't know that it's a fact we were guests but we were waiting in the wings and more to come so let's not you know, let's be honest, respect where respect is due, and nobody gets more respect than what those guys did at the siege, beginning through the middle, and at the end. You're going to see that by the videos I do. So, by midnight, not long after, we were all in Regent's Park Barracks and the next video will take part from midnight on day one, 30th of April, until midnight, 1st of May, which is actually today. So there's an insight, lots more in the book. And as you'd expect, it's a specimen, that's me, that's Jamie Bell on the front, playing Rusty in the film Six Days. Feel free, and if you visit the website, it'd be great to see you.